Today is Tuesday, August 27th. Damien, what's on your mind? Besides this giant cold, what's on my mind today is the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is the perfect allegory for the modern bureaucratic state that controls immigration in these, the United States of America. And when I say the Wizard of Oz, I'm not talking about the book, I'm talking about the eponymous evil villain of the book, the Wizard of Oz, also known as Oz, the Great and Terrible. Oz, the Great and Powerful Oz. Oscar, Zoroaster, Fadric, Isaac, Norman, Henkel, Emmanuel, Ambrose, Diggs, seriously. Or Oz Pinhead as the acronym, dead serious. If you recall, Oz Pinhead is the eponymous and boss of Frank Baum's epic about a bored girl in the tornado-infested hellscape of Oklahoma. And one day she takes a uh, heroin-tinted potion that she probably bought from a traveling salesman. And she imagines herself leaving her almost Dust Bowl Oklahoma homestead with her boring uncle and aunt and floating up on a tornado to a magical hallucinogenic land full of emerald cities and golden roads and uh, little people and magical beings. As Dorothy's adventure progresses, she picks up three friends along the way and she has to wake each of them from some version of a heroin-induced stupor. Also, she has a dog, and that dog's never known a leash, but somehow he's perfectly trained, probably because he loves heroin. And our four heroin addicts and their uh, heroin-trained dog, they're on the way to the city of Oz, which is where the evil villain of this book, the actual evil, evil villain, the Oz Pinhead lives. And they are struck by the marvel that is the city, but perhaps the most marvelous and uh, technologically advanced thing is the fact that everything's made out of emerald. Now think about that. That is a technological feat that's probably unrivaled in early 20th century fiction. I'm not sure that Orson Welles could have come, come up with something that incredible. In fact, we would have to wait for the publication of Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age, A Young Girl's Primer, which would come out in the 1996-1997, depicting a world that was 200 years away from Dorothy's terrible, sand-strewn, uh, pre-Dust Bowl Oklahoma, um, to see a world where something comparable could be shown to human eyes reading upon the page. And that was a, a world where humanity had mastered nanotechnology and constructed buildings out of diamond. But anyway, they at least have some inkling that something uh, magical or something powerful is afoot. It's a vague inkling. The kind of inkling that uh, four people who've just come down off of a heroin bender after 36 hours might have. What they don't know is that Oz Pinhead, the great wizard of Oz, the great and terrible Oz of Oz, has no ability to actually grant their wishes. And this is key, because again, this all started about me telling you that uh, the Wizard of Oz is a perfect allegory for today's immigration agencies. What does the Wizard of Oz do instead? Well, he shows up as different fantastical animals for each of our heroin addicts, scaring their heroin addled minds into pure terror. They ask for stuff. But of course, what they don't know is that Oz Pinhead has no ability to actually grant these wishes. Instead, each of, our, each of our four friends go up to him and he appears as a different creature. And he tells them, I'm not going to grant your wish unless you do this uh, one crazy, impossible thing. You have to go kill this witch. And uh, she's uh, protected by a bunch of monkeys. And she has three powerful spells that she can cast, which might potentially breathe the end of you all. And uh, he doesn't tell them that they can just throw a bucket of water on her. They kind of have to figure that out on their own. They do the task, they do this impossible task. They come back and they're like, hey, what about my wishes? Scarecrow's like, hey, I want, I want, a, I want, a, I want a brain. Taman's like, I want a heart. And Lion's like, I want, a, I want courage. Dorothy's like, I just, I just want to go home. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Oh, the great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Nobody's ever like succeeded, you know, defeating this bureaucratic maze of tasks I've, I've sent along. I might as well tell you, 
I'm just an old man. And uh, I've been feeding you, you know, projections through this magical, you know, set of technologies that I have. Um, and uh, guess what? You've all had what you, what you wanted all along. And Dorothy, you can just uh, pop in the balloon and go home. And when I'm working with USCIS, Department of Labor, Department of State, it often feels like I'm working with the Wizard of Oz. I'm fighting for something that I know is my client's right to have all along. It's their right to adjust status because they have a US citizen spouse. It's their right as an employer to bring in H2B workers because they have a seasonal business or they have a one-time need or a peak load business. It's my client's right to get a visa to come to the United States or to get a renewal visa to come to the United States because they don't, they've done nothing wrong. In some cases, USCIS has approved and Department of State says no. And I'm forced on behalf of my clients and they're forced to pay me money to go through these giant impossible bureaucratic quests to kill the witch or get 16,000 things notarized or prove the unprovable. Like how do you prove end of life? I had to do that once and won that on appeal. And then I have to come back to the Wizard of Oz and Wizard of Oz goes, oh great. You know what? I'm just a bureaucratic old man or woman and uh, this was yours to have all along. You're right, I shouldn't have issued that uh, request for evidence, but don't take my word for it. The reason I'm thinking about this is because I have, I have, I have uh, three stories. One involving me and, and two involving the ultimate, the ultimate unmasker of Oz the Great uh, in the immigration world, who's a, who's a super lawyer named Bradley Benias. Okay, so Bradley Benias is somebody you should know. If you're in, if you have U visas or you have outstanding EB-5s that aren't getting approved, or you need to take anything to litigation, then Brad Benias should be probably the first person that you call. I, I send him clients often enough where I think he gets annoyed. So here are two examples that are illustrative uh, from, from Brad's practice that, that, that I think go towards this point. But let's, let's throw this Wizard of Oz book away first, okay? So this caught my eye. You know, he, he's on Twitter, Benias Law, at Benias Law. And he talks about how he does a lot of work to help the U visa community, and he takes cases to mandamus litigation all the time. He'll take them monthly at this point. He has a cool service where he's uh, created a way for people to pro se file U visas with, with a little bit of his help and, and the help of this one organization he's helped founded. But here's what he discovered. So he says, I have one case where we allege that USCIS does not issue the actual U visas in filing or priority date order. Without evidence, USCIS, this is in court, swore that it did. I offered to dismiss the case if USCIS would provide proof it issued the visas in chronological order. Why is it important that visas should be issued in chronological order? Because we tell our clients when we file these U visas, hey, you've just got X years to wait. There's 40,000 cases in front of you. They get processed at 10,000 a year. That means you have five years to wait. If they don't get issued in chronological order, which I assure you they don't based on when my U visa bona fide determinations and work permits come back, then that means that we can't know and those clients can't know when their visas will be issued because people are jumping uh, uh, in front of them in line, for lack of a better term. So the USCIS is supposed to, furthermore, by law process these in chronological order. And Brad Benias, who's been around the block many, many times, has noticed in just late, late terms, when you look around at all your different uh, clients, that this is not what happens. But USCIS insisted that it did. For the first time after a court order, USCIS turned over all of the evidence that they planned to rely on to defend the case. This included three spreadsheets and a declaration explaining, quotes, the spreadsheets. The declaration interprets the spreadsheets to mean USCIS decided only 14 cases out of 10,000 out of order. That would be a miracle and completely at odds with what we see in the real world. But a layman's review, my expert will get it next week, shows that USCIS skipped at least 1,400 U visa applicants during fiscal year 2024 alone, and likely twice that amount for fiscal year 2023. The only way to show their declarations are wrong is to get the data they rely upon. This is USCIS, because data don't lie. And you can get this data through FOIA litigation. In this scenario, USCIS is the Emerald City, and the Justice Department attorneys, or attorney in this case, are the Wizard of Oz, who's been hired to, pr to protect the Emerald City, i.e. USCIS, at all costs. 
USCIS wanted to, the Justice Department lawyer to argue that only 14 out of 10,000 applications had ever been processed out of order. But even a brief review by Brad Benias showed that at least 3,200 cases have been processed out of order in just 2024 and 2023, with the likely number being much higher. And who knows what happened in previous years? This means that people who are waiting for U visas for a long time, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 years going into the future, are losing out on years and years of legal eligibility because USCIS does not have a proper process in place. The Wizard of Oz is the Justice Department lawyer, but what it tells us is that even the city of Green Emerald itself is in some ways just a house of cards ready to fall if questioned. And one has to ask themselves, why is the Emerald City, i.e. USCIS, hiring and directing its wizards, i.e. the Justice Department lawyers, to protect and lie in courts in order to allow USCIS to continue doing things that they know are not good for American clients, for American resident clients, when what they should be doing is actually fixing the processes that they're charged with the management of. But lest you think that is the uh, isolated incident, Here's another case from stellar attorney Brad Benias. This one's from five months ago. And this one has to do with the Office of Foreign Labor Certification at the Department of Labor, which certifies PERM applications and certifies things like the H2B program, which I am very, very involved in, as you may know if you watch this channel. He says, this is from five months ago, so it's about March 2024. I deposed the head of the OFLC this week, Office of Foreign Labor Certification, in a case challenging current PERM processing times. PERMs are, you have to get PERMs processed in order to bring in applicants on green cards if you're an employer. The administrator of OFLC testified that the Department of Labor has 12 full-time analysts, quote unquote, on PERM applications, with a flex team of six more analysts who go back and forth between PERM and H2 and H2B. This is insane. This is insane because of the number of PERM applications there are per year. In 2018, there were 116,000 PERM applications. In 2019, there were 104,000, 108,000 2020, 94,000 2021, 102,000 2022, 119,000 in 2023. 12 analysts. And what the administrator testified is that they typically decide 50 PERMs per day, those 12, at approximately eight minutes per PERM. That's an easy 12,000 a month. That's an easy 120,000 a year with holidays, leave, et cetera. But DOL hasn't received more than 120,000 perms per year. And so there should be no perm backlog if this is true. Right now in 2024, it's taking 407 days to adjudicate a perm. That's well over a year. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is that if we pull back the curtain on the Department of Labor and on their administrators or their analysts who here, let's say the analysts here are the wizard and the Department of Labor is the Wizard of Oz. They're not doing 50 perms a day. They're not adjudicating in eight minutes increments. They're not adjudicating these in the order they're received. They're adjudicating these in an arbitrary manner. And in fact, what we know, just to pull the curtain further, we know that DOL relies on contractors. We know that people work from home. We know that they don't have a lot of direct management of their employees. And that has led to a dramatic drop in quality of the work put out by these officers over the past several years, or at least every year that I've been involved, things seem to get worse. The Wizard of Oz and this city of Oz are perfect encapsulations, or perfect representations, rather, of what happens within our agency. One more story. You know, taking what's happened with Brad, I had a case this uh, week that, again, just angers me to no end, where the Department of Labor issues a notice of deficiency to a client on August 1st. In that notice of deficiency, they don't give a reason for why a registration number for the client is being taken away. I challenge, I write to the HW Ombudsman, I write to the certifying officer, I even put in an NOD response just in case under protest. Ombudsman listens, certifying officer reissues a clarification on that NOD on August 13th, which is an NOD 2, it's a second NOD. 
For an NOD, you get 10 business days to respond. The second NOD contains a very important clarification, which essentially changes the entire nature of the first NOD on the basis of its issuance, requiring the employer to go back and create a whole new response. And again, we have 10 business days. On the seventh business day, this certifying officer decides that they're going to use that NOD response from the first NOD that we turned in on August 12th to be a stand-in for the response we would have probably given to the August 13th NOD. This isn't a process where I'm supposed to email the officer, not that I have a way to do that, or upload to flag the fact that, hey, we got your NOD clarification August 13th, we'll be responding within 10 business days. This is a process that's governed by federal regulations. 10 business days means 10 business days. But this officer wants to scare us away from challenging what was an initially terrible uh, judgment on their part in the first NOD where they made a major mistake and now they're trying to throw us off the case by issuing denial within a regulatory period that is completely illegal as far as the federal, federal regulations are concerned. And now I'm gonna have to go to appeal at the OALJ, Office of Administrative Law Judges, and hell, we might even take this to the federal circuit because the DOL and their certifying officers who are all a bunch of Oz wizards would rather be able to do whatever they want than to take the time to do the right thing. So that's why I'm thinking about the Wizard of Oz. Sometimes, when I look at what's happening to my clients, I feel like I, I'm on heroin. I feel like I'm hallucinating. I feel like I can't possibly be living in the real world, which within this bureaucratic ecosystem is supposed to be governed by regulations. It's supposed to be covered by rules because the rules only seem to apply to applicants, to US workers, to US employers, to the immigrants who are applying for benefits, and they don't apply to the city of Oz and the fake wizards that lie within. That's what I'm thinking about.